let's start with uh, our event in December. We presented uh, two HX50s, one on wheels, one on skids for the very first time to the public. Uh, it was the first time uh, our customers uh, and followers had the, the opportunity to sit in the aircraft and experience the, the aircraft. And what this really demonstrated is that Hill Helicopters has been able to fuse aircraft capability with a modern aircraft from 2024 with premium automotive quality. We also validated our vertical integration strategy in so much as we were able to manufacture all of the key elements that we needed to uh, and bring the attributes and the price point uh, together at a very, very accelerated time scale. So really pleased with that. We also took the aircraft, as Misha mentioned, over to HIA uh, and showcased the, the machine to the commercial operator market market for the very first time at the end of February. Um, we didn't really know how we were going to be received in the, uh, in the, the commercial market, but uh, as, it, as it turns out, essentially, if you deliver an aircraft with the right performance, a modern up-to-date platform with the right balance of safety, uh, purchase and operating cost, and the quality that we've become known for in terms of the design and the, the general feature richness of the aircraft, then the aircraft resonates just as much with commercial operators uh, as it does with our private audience. We received an incredible welcome from the, uh, the commercial market, uh, and we've got lots of new and interesting avenues to, to pursue and lots of very welcome feedback for the various commercial roles that people anticipate HC50 becoming involved with in, uh, in coming years. So really grateful to all the folks at HAI and to everyone that we got to meet with in the industry uh, while we showcased the, the product. So thank you very much for the, uh, the warm welcome. Uh, since we last spoke uh, ahead of the, uh, the Duxford unveil, uh, sales have remained incredibly strong for both HX and HC50. Uh, we've now sold 900 uh, HX50s, 366 C models in 70 countries, so 1,266 aircraft in total. Um, what we're seeing is that the 50 series truly meets the needs of both private and commercial operators. We've we've managed to engineer the product that we wanted and it's resonating nicely with both of those markets. So very pleased with that. When we talk about the expansion of our production facilities, um, we we briefed you on our dual, appro uh, dual site approach during the Duxford event. Uh, fundamentally, we've pursued a direct planning application to develop a purpose-built, all-in-one uh, production and global headquarters facility as long as we possibly can. And we're now at the point where we need to decouple uh, the, the need to deliver production facilities today, expanded development facilities today, from the longer time period of getting a, an all singing, all dancing HQ uh, developed out. What we elected to do is essentially expand our rented facilities uh, to allow us to seamlessly move from development into production in a modular fashion. So keep accumulating uh, larger rented spaces until we've got sufficient capacity to produce the volume that we need, uh, and then carry out the flight ops using the permitted development rules which allows us to build a facility within 28 days uh, with a planning essentially a planning notification that requires only 28 days eliminating all of the the problems that we've we've had to date so in uh, to, on that note uh, since the start of the year we have now acquired and completed on a lease of the facility that will now become known as production center one so pc1 uh, is designed to allow us to bring all of the activities that go on within dc one two and three together complete the development process and gradually uh, develop out the production uh, infrastructure that we need all under one roof and then we'll expand that space Space in a cellular, cellular manner to increase the capacity to where we need it to be in line with the targeted production date. So really pleased with that. We recorded a, uh, a brief walk around the, uh, the new facility earlier today. So let's take a look at that. Welcome to Production Center One.
one of the most important things in being able to rapidly execute a development project is getting the culture right within your organisation. And one of the things that's been quite challenging for us over the last couple of years has been as we've grown organically and spread from one to two to three development centres, maintaining the connection between key members of the, the team, maintaining that close-knit and interactive way of working has become increasingly difficult with the team spread over three units that are just five minutes apart. What Production Centre One allows us to do is bring all of the development activities back into one location, have everybody working together properly, pulling out everything we can out of all of the real benefits of vertical integration, both for development and then as we move seamlessly into production. In addition to having a building that is uh, around 50% bigger than the building that one of the leading helicopter manufacturers started production in, uh, we've also got an expansive yard area that provides storage facilities for us. It also provides a space for us to conduct some of the testing that we need to do outdoors. Some of the uh, riskier tests need to be in uh, armoured enclosures and we need space outside to be able to do that. We've got all the loading bays that we need to be able to facilitate the flow of materials in and out of the factory as well as a brand new purpose-built unit for us to build our production facility in. Within this facility we're going to have the new gantry mill right down in the far corner of the facility down there away from the offices away from the electrical stuff away from all the important precision stuff we're then going to have an air conditioned machine shop over the other side for the precision production of gears bearings turbine components servo actuators all the other fancy stuff that goes into the helicopter down this right hand side of the building here will be the composites production line everything from the patterns and molds that come off the gantry mill all the way up here to finished assemblies of composite parts. We'll have uh, the machine shop down the far end, then the, the paint shop, some trim and build stations, all the way through the electrical build shop, the avionics and electrical uh, laboratory facilities. And then we'll have a, a customer showroom, a customer lounge, and then all of the offices uh, up there in the, uh, the mezzanine layer. Down the bottom, over the top of the machine shop, because we have to air condition it, we'll be putting in a mezzanine floor. And then on the top of that will be the, the trim shop uh, and the, the wiring shop as well. So all of the things that we need to be able to uh, produce the various elements of this, this helicopter. So of course this place looks like a vast empty cavern, but of course you've seen all of that before with DC 1, 2 and 3. We're quite accustomed to taking empty units like this and turning them into production facilities. So this is Production Centre 1. What you're going to see over the next couple of months is us turning this plan into a vivid reality within these four walls, bringing our production capability along just in time for the conclusion of the development programme. Let's talk about the uh, compressor impeller manufacturing uh, to start with. So we are currently uh, manufacturing the GT50 test compressor. So this is the one that will actually run in the gas generator and the power turbine tests that are going to take, uh, uh, take place later this year. Essentially what we're doing now is over the, the course of the last 18 months or so, you've seen us develop the processes to manufacture uh, impellers and curvix, get all the balancing right, get all of the quality right, get the geometry right, then do that in the right alloys. Now we're taking those processes and developing the production grade versions of those processes. So processes where every single dimension is where it needs to be. All of the heat treatment is correct. All of the inspection processes are correct so that we've got an aerospace quality part that is representative of a production article to the, the greatest extent that you can with a, with a prototype. So that's meant that we've, we've essentially, uh, we're currently essentially completing the production production optimization in terms of the material sourcing, in, tool, in, uh, in terms of tool wear. Uh, machining these, uh, these alloys is extremely demanding on tool tips. And as a production process, we have to make sure we trade off the production rate versus the tool wear to get the optimum balance between quality and, uh, and price point for this. We've got all of the treatments, all of the inspections, the balancing of the wheels, and then managing the clearances between the impeller tip and the stationary components. All of that is being brought together for this production article. And uh, as, as I say, over the course of the, the next week or two, we'll be producing the first GT50 uh, impeller to run in a test engine. 
Uh, and what you can see at the moment is if I just drop back over here is on the five axis what the guys have been doing during the course of today is just picking up from where we left off uh, at the tail end of last year working on the various cutting strategies we can use to minimize that tooltip wear and to reduce the time it takes to machine one of these impellers down to the absolute minimum. So we're sitting at about 30 hours uh, on one of these at the moment and we think we can get that down a little bit further. So each of these different passages is trialing a different cut strategy before we go and cut the test impeller on on the fully heat treated, fully inspected aerospace quality billet that will go into the first GT50 engine. We've talked a lot over the, uh, the program about the importance of FADEC, having a, a simplified startup and shutdown procedure, really tight RPM governing, and the dual FADEC part of the, uh, the, the GT50 is crucial to its success in this application. So the FADEC system development board so this is the very first physical embodiment of our fadex system has now been built and delivered we have it right over here i'll show you in a in a second the fadex control laws have been developed and are, are now sitting on the fadex board waiting to be tested with a model in the loop and then later with hardware in the loop uh, we'll show you later and we've, we've posted some stuff publicly about how we've been developing out the details of the fuel control, the ignition control and the characterization of that whole process within the combustion test rig and then as soon as that's completed essentially we're then doing some model in the loop testing and it's on to the gas generator test to use the, uh, the FADEX system to control that engine right there so really pleased with that. The board itself if I just explain it, all of the FADEC functionality is really carried out within this, this simple aerospace grade chip here. The rest of the details on the board here are really to make it easy for our engineers to uh, connect the, the sensors and the various inputs and outputs. So all of these different terminals will consolidate down to a simple plug in the production unit. And it's just this core box here that goes into the, the, uh, the unit that goes on the aircraft. You've got a power supply here and more input output ports out here. But this is the very first GT50 uh, uh, FADEC unit uh, right there uh, waiting for a gas generator to control. So really pleased to have that here uh, ready for, for testing. Um, <coughs> we released some stuff uh, about two or three weeks ago now um, showing the very first signs of life from GT50. So this is the very first part of the, the very first test rig that we're using to test and develop the combustion system for GT50. Now for those of you that aren't aware, combustion in a jet engine is a really complicated process. The chemistry is complicated, the aerodynamics and the thermodynamics are really complicated. It's relatively difficult to predict analytically and so the way you design these things is to use a mixture of empirical knowledge and best practice, some very sophistic sophisticated CFD simulations, but ultimately you're reliant on comprehensive testing to make sure that you're getting the atomization in the fuel that you need, that the, the, the flame uh, and the, the recirculation currents and the dilution currents that you need within the combustion system are doing what they want. And then building an annular combustor makes that even more difficult to develop because you physically can't see anything. So the purpose of this rig is to allow us to develop out the detail of our fuel injection models, uh, our air blast, atom uh, air blast atomizers, the fuel control strategy and then the geometry of the combustion chamber and the geometry of the flame to make sure that the flame itself stays where it's meant to stay, is stable, it can be ignited throughout the range of flow conditions that we need it to uh, and that we don't impinge on the, uh, the delicate combustion liners that would kill the, the combustion uh, the annular combustor in no time at all. So all of that work is ongoing and it's ongoing on the combustion test rig and the preliminary results that we had were fantastic. So in that image that you can see on the screen there you can see that the flame is stopped and trapped near the igniter and near the fuel injection system which makes sure that we've got fuel and fresh air and a spark all in the same place so that we can sustain stable combustion over a range of operating conditions. We're, that was the very first run, so the flame's not the right shape and it's not the right color, and there's lots of things that still need to be developed out with that. But fundamentally, a lot of the key parameters that we needed to see working in this first run worked beautifully. We can hold the flame stable, we can ignite reliably, and now we've just got to tune the, the fuel injection and the air blast atomizer to get that shape burning, uh, get the chemistry of the 
combustion right and get that process working properly. Let's go and take a quick look at the combustion test rig. <coughs> So when you look at this test rig, what we've essentially got here is if you imagine our annular combustor that goes all the way around the engine, this is essentially a slice through one of the fuel injections. So it's a what this is one twelfth of our annular combustor. And the beauty of doing it like this is by doing it on a test bench, we can, we can provide windows to observe the flame. We can, uh, we can provide access for all sorts of instrumentation for temperatures and pressures and various other things that we measure. And of course, we can separate out all of the elements of the fuel control system so we can tune and optimize them independently before they get embedded into a um, uh, a compact system to go onto the engine itself. So the test rig here will allow us to develop out all of those things. There's a, a simple a simple thing that we've just attached to the side here, which is allowing us to visualize the fuel spray and test the atomization under various conditions that we need for the engine, looking at the effect of the fuel uh, control system and how we do all of that. And then at the front of it here, we've got a simple Venturi mass flow meter so that we can control the ratio of air mass flow and fuel mass flow to get stoichiometry and to get the fuel, uh, the fuel air mix and the, the chemistry of all of that process right. Uh, this rig's work to treat. We've already learned a great deal from it. There's still a lot of work left to do on this, but within the, the space of the, the coming weeks, we'll have the fuel nozzle sorted, we'll have the air blast atomizer uh, sorted, and that then frees us up to go and run this in the full annular combustor.